Well, welcome back, everybody, to the Tech Whispers podcast. Have you ever worked with someone who leads with strong values? And by that, what I mean is someone who has that, I'm willing to leave a job and even get fired from a job over kind of values. So our guest today is CIO legend, Chris Jelm, whose Midwestern values were the underpinnings of a career that has taken him to Fortune, Behemoth, Kroger, and FedEx, highly innovative tech companies, Orbitz, and eBay, as well as a couple of startups along the way. Today, Chris serves on three boards and doing some really interesting advisory work as well. While Chris kept a pretty low profile during his CIO tenure, he was still recognized with the Ohio CIO of the Year Orby Award just this year. He was also the recipient of the prestigious Fisher Hopper Prize for Lifetime Leadership. This was sponsored by the Berkeley Haas School. He joins other industry luminaries, Filippo Passerini from Procter & Gamble, Rebecca Rhodes Raytheon, and Karen Terrell at Walmart when they all received that award. So Chris, I'm excited to welcome you to the podcast. Thanks for joining us. Uh, love shining the light on CIO legends. But let's start by unpacking those values that earn you such great respect. And while also being the impetus for you getting fired, by one high profile CEO, we won't mention, and one of those great companies. So where did that journey begin, Chris? What were some of those core values and how do they impact those associates who work for you along the way? Well, Dan, uh, thanks for the question. It's great to be spending time together. You know, the values really were grounded, I'm sure in my Midwest upbringing, um, you know, Midwestern family, middle class, and yeah, you know, from an early age, working hard was important. You know, washing my dad's car, painting houses, cutting grass. I mean, you did what you had to do for spending money. But along the way, you were learning lessons. And those lessons were important. I remember catting for my dad and he he basically said, hey, you know, we're playing with Dr. X. He sold pharmaceuticals for Pfizer. We were playing golf with this doctor, this pharmacist. And he would ask me, he goes, so well, what do you know about them? I go, well, I don't know them. I just met them. And he goes, well, I expect you to get to know who they are. And so he would ask me at the end of the round, well, what did you learn about Dr. You know, so-and-so? And it was a way of kind of teaching me that, look, relationships are super important. And you have to have a be willing to engage with people, but you also have to be willing to listen and create a relationship. And that, you know, I'm doing that as a teenager on the golf course, but I, those kinds of lessons stuck with me throughout my life. And I think, you know, when you apply those to a work environment, you get good results, right? But no one, you know, ever complains about you working hard or rarely complains about you working hard unless you're out working someone who doesn't like it. Uh, you know, being consistent, doing a good job every time, producing a quality product, whether it's, you know, waxing a car and having you know, my dad look at it and say it was good, or my mom doing the white glove treatment, we cleaned the house on Saturday. You know, those things are, are consistently applied throughout life. And I think in the work environment are just equally, equally important. I think getting to know your team, my father asking me about, you know, what do you know about, you know, the doctor you're playing golf with today or catting alongside? You need to know who your people are. You need to know what is important to them, both personally and professionally. I, I always, you know, in my leadership seminar, which we'll probably touch on later, I'll, I always would remind people or ask people with this scenario, and, and it's, you're having a team meeting and it's in the late afternoon and someone basically says, hey, I've got to go. And it's a really important part of the conversation. If that person just steps up and, and leaves, you may think, well, that person doesn't care about what we're doing. But if you knew that that person had a special needs child and that was the only time that therapist or professional was in town, you would all be kicking that person out the door and making sure they left early. Mm. And you have to understand people at a, a more granular level. And it, it, to me, a lot of leaders are uncomfortable going down that path. They think it's a little invasive. They think they're, you know, you know, maybe asking too many questions. And to me, you can't effectively work with people and lead people unless you you build those deeper relationships. So good. Yeah, so good. 
you know, Chris, as you were talking about the caddy story, and uh, this is pre-internet, pre-LinkedIn, right? So you had to talk to the doctor to get to know him, him or her, right? And and uh, that's a skill we're we're losing today. Well, and we'll talk about storytelling, I'm sure, along the way. And you've had several of your uh, other podcasts where people have talked about storytelling, and I think it's a it's part of that. It's part of spending time with people, with teams, with broader organizations in different forums, and having conversations, frankly, that are memorable because the story was interesting. The, the story was memorable. And I think even the, the caddy story was just an example, right? We could have said, hey, you know, you need to build relationships. And, but when you talk about the story behind why you believe what you believe or why you have a certain value, then it comes to life and people can, they have their own stories, but they learn that that story is what connects the most important point. And I think often, to your comment, we do these video calls, everyone's, you know, in 15 minute blocks of time. And you need to learn to be able to sit down and have that deeper dialogue where you get those insights, you get those, you know, motivational stories. It's like, what matters to someone really? Sometimes mm -hmm. it's, Sometimes it's, you know, the success of their kids and being able to put them through college because maybe they didn't go to college, but they believe that's important. Maybe it's a parent who's, you know, not feeling well or has a, you know, some illness that, you know, they want to be able to spend more time. And if you have that relationship and you can have that open and transparent conversation, I find it's easier to flex. It's easier to facilitate that personal value, um, personal journey, important thing to be realized, which creates just a, a, a lifetime, frankly, of connection and value. So well put. And, you know, speaking of stories, uh, we, we talk often, uh, you reference Fred Smith. You worked at FedEx early in your career, 13 years, uh, late 80s and through the 90s. Um, you, you've had some great stories. I mean, he's just legendary, right? Even though that uh, oh, Yale, yeah. Yale gave him a C on his paper about you know starting a <laughs> company called FedEx. But uh, what did you learn there? Because you took that to be very successful in tech companies, startups, big big corporates. Yeah, well, and it's the foundation of the values based leadership seminar that I kind of built in you know post FedEx and throughout used it throughout the rest of my career. And even now, when I go speak at universities or you know, different forums, a lot of that still comes through. He, a couple things that come to mind. First, he is a visionary. He's a strategic thinker. He, he, was, he was basically trained in, in the Marine Corps and they do a hell of a job of training leaders. But he, he, would, he would set out an aggressive vision. He would set super high expectations. I mean, think about the Marines. You know, talk about high expectations, but they don't get any higher. But he brought that to the workplace and he brought quality, which it'd be interesting to know how the military tells the quality story, but he was a big Deming disciple. And this notion of quality equals productivity was something that was just drilled into us every step of the way. And I, I also think it was this aggressiveness. He was aggressive. Most Marines I know, not all of them, but many of them are, but not afraid to fail. And I think in the business business setting, particularly in mature companies, that often gets lost. That be aggressive, willing to fail, which is why a lot of companies have a very aggressive M and A program, because they've learned that you know they can't do it themselves anymore. And I think to to maintain that that aggressiveness and to maintain an innovative culture as companies grow and FedEx you know, obviously became a super successful, super large business. Uh, but, you know, he did a really good job of keeping that edge. And, and to me, it went back to this, this leadership program, which every successive level of management, you would get this, you know, like week long, you know, at least two or three days. And there were like four different levels of this development program. And you, you got different things along the way that were more pertinent to maybe the first line manager job, 
purposes, which was very principle based. And, you know, like, what are the essence? What's the essence of management? What's what what is leadership? What are the differences? How do you excel at them? Who, you know, and, and to me, that was super impactful because while I maybe thought I had a lot of leadership potential and you know, I've been captain of the basketball team or the golf team or, you know, in various school leadership functions, but to bring it to life with a little bit more definition and a little bit more clarity about what are the elements of, you know, being a good leader. Uh, to me, when you had that and then you took a chance to see him do what he did every day. I mean, I remember sitting in a basically a weekly um, review meeting and it was a basically an operations review. And if something didn't go well, you you better have understood what didn't go well and why and what you were going to do to make damn sure it didn't happen again. You know, so you had this focus on quality, but at the same time, you know, we'd get these uh, red memos, the infamous red memos. And if you got one and your name was on it, you you better pay attention and you better be responding <laughs> quickly. The red memo. They're always saying it was on red paper. Uh, I don't know how they do it today in, in the digital age. I don't know if the you know how how Rob Carter and the team have you know solved for that. But you know, fundamentally, you, you were on point. And I'll, I'll never forget. He, Fred wanted to introduce a new service, and he wanted it launched by the fall. And this was probably in the summertime. And there was a lot of complexities to how the services would get implemented across the various business units, particularly in the tracking world. In the tracing where we had all these handheld devices that the couriers were using, which was an innovative device, which was a custom built device by FedEx to really one of the first examples of mobility in a mm. big way. And he wanted to launch it by the fall. And I was in charge of, you know, most things uh, on the tech side at that point. And uh, I had a group of people that were kind of the program managers and we were responsible for executing big, big large, complex things. And I told him, I said, look, I, I can get it done by February. Well, the chairman was not happy with that answer. And he called me up and he, he started reading me the riot act. And we had a healthy discussion and I explained to him why. And I think he understood it, but, but being aggressive and pushing hard. And he's like, you know, all right, Del, Joan, you know, damn it, better be done by February. But a lot of people wouldn't be comfortable with that conversation. Right. And, and the worst thing you can do is overpromise and underdeliver. And in that case, was you know going to be aggressive regardless of the the February date was still aggressive. And you, but you have to help. You have to have that dialogue. And you know you have to. You can't be afraid of that dialogue. Does it make you a smidge uncomfortable? Sure especially at lower levels of the organization. And if you haven't been in the room with that person a lot, yeah, he was an intimidating man for a, you know, a young associate. Fortunately, I'd grown up with my father who was also in the military. And uh, I was used to, you know, a little tough love once in a while and some pretty aggressive conversations and a little bit of swearing. So I was good. Um, but that, that to me is part of a leader's job is, you know, standing up and, you know, doing what's right, both for the organization, for your people, you know, but also as you learn over time, increasingly for shareholders, when you're in a management role, particularly at a senior management role and at a board level, you, you have an accountability to a group of people who have, who have made an investment in your business. And the, the context for all of those stakeholders and when, when you have to shine a light on you know, who you're really serving and why, you just can't lose sight of. And I think the most important piece of that puzzle when you went through the, the leadership training was the servant-based leadership mindset, which is very much out of the military. And the, the point fundamentally is, and you've had multiple guests who have talked about it, but, you know, my job as a leader is to serve the people who work for me. I'm accountable to. My job is to help them do theirs. And I always would start a new hire orientation at Kroger. And I did it at other places too, but in Kroger in particular, and I would ask this question, I go, all right, you know, whose job's more important, yours or mine? 
and you know everybody was kind of hesitant to answer right. they were a little intimidated like here's you know one of the senior execs in the company you know asking me a question i don't want to be wrong and they would you know often you know struggle a bit and i go okay let me give you an example what if the computer operator doesn't show up what if the help desk person doesn't show up what if the developer doesn't show up to work every day i said the business doesn't work without them the person at the you know checking customers out at the front of the store the person stocking the, the meat department i said our jobs are different i have a lot of accountability but make no mistake whose job is most important mm. to the day-to-day -day success of the business and to me you back to telling stories telling those stories using those examples I, I would expect that most people that went through that orientation class would remember that conversation. And when they get into a leadership role, hopefully they remember it and it's not about them. You know, a lot of times people get into a management role and they think they become super important all of a sudden. And their only importance is making sure that their people are successful and have what they need to do their job. Yeah, well put. Although hope, hope they get the right answer with their future EVP who may not have the same mindset as you. <laughs> but often they, honestly, Dan, I think often they don't. And it's why organizations uh, lose follow followership. Mm. They lose passion. They lose uh, commitment. And you, know, you see higher levels of turnover you see organizations become kind of rudderless. And I believe most of the time, that's a leadership failure. And it's, you know, somebody doesn't have my back. Somebody isn't getting me the tools that I need to do my job. And people, I always would tell, you know, my teams, I said, look, the, the team members, we call them associates at Kroger, our associates see everything. You may not think they see it, but if you're inconsistent, if you're not valuing their work, if you're making a decision that has a negative impact on their life, and there's not a damn good reason behind it, that they can understand and may not like, but they at least understand it, then you've you've taken a big loss. And you know, people often didn't see the losses. And I'm just like, you, you have to understand, you have to put yourself in their shoes. Remember when you were a, you know programmer for the first time or you were a DBA for the first time and remember what that was like and I, I just feel like so many you know leaders get disconnected and you just can't be disconnected and part of it is communications and that was another thing that you know I mean FedEx measured you on your effectiveness of connecting with your teams and we had you know the whole like Frequency of communications, depth of communications, how you share company strategy, how you share company results, and those that playbook was one that I I ran the rest of my career, and I and by and as a mentor today to companies where I'm on the board, same kind of thing. It's like, hey, tell me how you communicate with your teams. Have you thought about this? Maybe you should try a different approach. And and to me, you know, that servant-based leadership models just super important and the communications piece of the puzzle is probably when when I work with new leaders and did over my career that was probably often became my number one focus for for teams no it's part of your secret sauce for sure and yeah, I appreciate the what you mentioned about the difficult conversations having the hard conversations the tough love um we have uh four amazing mystery questions for you people who have worked with you along the along the journey and i want to play the first one because uh he kind of unpacks um well, i don't want to say too much but he unpacks an early conversation you had with an executive team so let's listen in and then uh, tell us who this is and you'll have fun with this question hey i thought maybe it would be interesting for you to talk to us a little bit about your first couple months at kroger and the relationship you had with senior leadership and how you made them feel uncomfortable about um, the current state of the technology group and where you needed to take them. And, and really the overall importance of, of pushing back and questioning and the importance of the new guy 
making you know the senior leaders uncomfortable? How was that for you? Uh, well, Nick Kaufman, who uh, worked for me f- for many years at Kroger, great guy. Thanks, Nick, for the question. Uh, so it's it's one of those classic stories. There were actually several events, but I'll, I'll I'll pick one and we decide if we have time for the other. But I had to basically came into a organization that had been around for a long time. I mean, when I got there, Kroger had been around for almost 100 years at that time, over 100 years at that time. And there was a sense of entitlement, you know, lifetime employment. And frankly, we weren't performing well. And we needed to change rapidly. And I remember going to the management team and basically saying, look, we're going to do a complete reset on performance. I'm going to give everybody a new review and we're going to do it in, you know, a month. And there's going to be a bunch of people that aren't going to get a good answer. They may have been on a five point scale. They may have been fours and fives, but. They're frankly twos, maybe a couple ones and a bunch of threes. And it's these people, most of them, many of them aren't going to make the long-term journey with us. And we're going to force that to happen aggressively. And I remember several of my peers basically said, oh, that's going to create problems. There's going to be legal issues. And I said, look, I said, you, you hired me to supposedly make you uncomfortable and to make this a better place to create a you know, winning culture and a, an innovative tech-centered business. And, you know, if I, if I screw it up, fire me. And the room was quiet because I bet my job on being successful. And I, I bet my job um, multiple times and I walked away from places where I felt that my, my values were not consistent with the business where I was working. And the good news is that, you know, for the vast part of my career, uh, my values were really aligned to Kroger. One other, I'll tell you the other quick story because it's really a relevant board. First meeting with the board, I'm the new, the new CIO and I'm telling the, you know, got to spend a half a billion dollars to upgrade the infrastructure, stores, data centers. It was a big number and it was a ton of work, but you got to build the credibility. You have to have a reliable business. And we had point of sale outages during holidays. We had payment switch issues, which I'm like, hell no, right? This is going to be a five nine service. Not every service is five nines, but payments, some the ability to take someone's debit or credit card, mm. that's going to work. And my first holiday season, I, I started in August and Thanksgiving was a nightmare. Christmas was a nightmare, right? Those are the busiest days of the year. Everybody's shopping on the day before Thanksgiving or on Christmas Eve. And I was like, no, not doing that again. And, and knock on wood, you know, we, we fixed those issues. And that was a highly reliable service going forward. But back to the board story. So the, the, the guy that was running, he was lead independent director. And he goes, he goes, Chris, stop. He goes, you're here for a reason. We know we need to change. He goes, the real question I have for you is, did the guys at the end of the table, and it happened to be all guys at the time, CEO, COO, CFO, do they get it? And do they support you? In fact, how would you grade them on getting it? So uh, my, my wheels were spinning. The CEO at the time was Dave Dillon. Great guy. Great storyteller, by the way. Like he could, It was like sitting in a fireside chat every time with Dave Dillon. And he goes, and he talked for like 30 seconds to give me a chance to formulate my answer. I'm convinced that's why he did it. <laughs> and I, I said, all right, for, so first of all, let me, let me start with calibration. Fred Smith at FedEx is a 10. He gets technology. He's an innovator. Quality is number one. So he's a 10. And I said, these guys are, you know, and I explained we had just had a major outage of logistics where there are uh, warehouses were down for up to 30 over half our warehouses were down for up to up to 30 hours right we didn't ship product for over a day in many of our stores oh it was a nightmare and i said look i said they were probably a two or a three i said they hired me so they obviously know that things need to change and i said maybe they got because of that one outage and because of you know how we explained it, how we educated them on what happened and why, and the importance of redundancy, and we, it was a storage array 
failure to be specific. But I'm like, there was no redundant storage array, right? It was a highly available storage array, but the array itself had no redundancy. And the tape backups weren't done in a, you know, a timely manner. So we couldn't restore services, you know, couldn't restore the data, you know, within minutes. It was 20, it was over a day old, the last tape backup. This is for like a warehouse, like behind the, you know, one of the largest retailers in the country. And uh, so I said, you know, maybe a three or a four. And I said, we're going to get, we're going to get a much higher score on your question, you know, within the next 12 months. And, you know, I'd say within, you know, a couple of years, they were, you know, probably in the six, seven range and, you know, probably higher today. But yeah, what was a, you know, by the way, that was one of those life, um, you know, defining questions where you could have opted out, right? You could have taken the easy answer and said, oh, these guys are great, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, that wasn't the honest answer. Right. And, and to me, honesty is so back to, you know, values is so important. And I, I, so many people are afraid of conflict and they're afraid of, frankly, you know, somebody going, I don't want you here anymore. Right. I don't like your answer. You're out. No. And you know, to me, I, I just wasn't willing to compromise on that point. And maybe to a fault throughout my career. Uh, sometimes I was probably a little bit too adamant, a little bit too, you know, truthful. And it got me in trouble once or twice. Yeah, I know you have no regrets. And um, and by the way, uh, Nick Nick did say that your golf game during the Kroger years was a C or a D. It's probably up to a B now in retirement. That's fair. It's a little better. It's still never <laughs> going to be great, but it's, he's probably right. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. That was uh, he had some great stories. Uh, obviously, you went through a lot together, and uh, thanks the world of you. Uh, I have another one, another great question here from someone who knows you very well, uh, someone you gave some great opportunities in coaching to. So let's let's listen in to this one. Hi, Chris. We worked together for a long time. And one of the things that I always admired about you and what you could even consider it as your superpower as a leader is your executive presence. You're always able to walk into any room, tell a story and get support and buy-in for areas that you felt we needed to invest in in technology or things that you just thought were important for an organization. Sometimes as IT professionals, we lose that story part of being able to talk to others and we, we sometimes get a little bit too technical. So can you talk a little bit about how you built that muscle on being able to have that executive presence and tell the story and to get buy-in, to get support in areas that you thought were important. Yeah, uh, thank you, Annette. Annette Hader, uh, Annette's, you know, was a member of the team at Kroger and, and Annette was, she was a great example of my earlier comment about communications and how vital they are. And her example of storytelling I went through media training earlier in, early in my career at FedEx, and it was the most impactful training on the communications front that I had ever, ever had. Um, one of the people that had worked for uh, Ronald Reagan was and helped him with his communications was doing this training program. And I remember her sticking a microphone in my face and interviewing me on camera and then deep, you know, debriefing you know, the team or the rest of the people in the class about my communications or lack thereof. And I was like, wow, I, I didn't think I was that bad. But part of it was, you know, going down the rabbit hole of my, my tech world. And she's like, who cares? Like, not, not relevant. You know, mm -hmm. I, told you, I told you this was your audience and you're talking about stuff that's not relevant. And I'll never forget that. I was like, yeah, she was exactly right. Like, who is your audience and what is their level of understanding about the topic that you may hold near and dear? You know, you love the intricacies of operating systems or, you know, networking or whatever, but most executives don't get it. And you always have to speak to the least common denominator of knowledge in the room. Mm. That, that was my philosophy. and. In that case, right, you've got to often take it a couple levels down. And I'll, I remember, you know, back to connecting with 
peoples and people and teams, a big piece of that, and they do it a lot with Toastmasters, which to me was a super valuable, you know, communications uh, training tool. But it's this impromptu speaking. It's giving someone a topic, like, th- like this second, and going, "Tell me a story. Tell me a story about baking an apple pie." And oh, by the way, you got 60 seconds to do it, right? So you've got to create a list kind of in your head. You got to prioritize what matters most. Think about the audience. You know, you, you got to do all that on the fly. And to me, it is something that you can get training for, but you have to practice it. And I watch people to get so scripted that it's painful. I'm not interested in the script. I'm interested in your, your personal belief. Like, what do you, what do you care about? What's your personal journey? And to me, it, it's hard to do that when things are overscripted. And in Annette's case, I, I used to do these, uh, I started doing this TV broadcast. Uh, we had an internal TV network at Kroger. You know, we had to reach hundreds of thousands of store associates. And then I, I basically said, hey, I want to do a TV broadcast for, you know, because we had technology people all over the country as well. And I wanted to do, well, reach them. I want to reach them in a personal way. So we did this TV broadcast and I did this thing. I don't know if you ever remember Jay Leno. He did uh, like jaywalking or right. you know, where he'd walk around and interview people asking questions. So I did this, they call it crisscrossing. And I'd take a camera crew with me and I'd go to different, you know, buildings um, and interview people. And I remember looking for Annette and she like was in the bathroom, like she disappeared. <laughs> And I'm like, Annette, I go, no, like, I want to talk to you. I want to get you on, you know, on camera. uh, And it was something she was really uncomfortable with. But then we kept working on it, got her some additional training. And then I would always, when we did our town halls, which we would do, you know, in uh, monthly, but we'd also do quarterly with quarterly earnings results. I would always pick one of the, you know, top leaders in the organization to do, go through the the business results for the company, right? And it's multifold, right? You want them to understand the business and what EBITDA is and, you know, where's revenue and why is it good or not good? And right, tell a story, right? And, you know, she was one of the early, you know, folks that was up there in front of the group telling that story. And then we debrief. And I think it's super important to debrief, honest debrief. Yeah. Loved this, like do more of this. This probably wasn't the finest you know, example you could have used. And let's talk about maybe what, what would be better. And that, that one-on-one time, I, and in my leadership seminar, I often talk about how much time should you spend with your teams. And it's, it's, not a, it's meant to be a genuine question. Like, tell me what you think you should be spending mentoring and developing your people. And I often get answers that are in the you know, 10%, 20%. And I honestly felt it should be closer to 50. And it, that otherwise you can't create a sustaining organization that lives without you and is successful. And so to me, I overinvested in that disproportionately thought it was valuable. But then you get people like Annette who, you know, really grow and, you know, she's super successful and, you know, left Kroger and is out, out doing great things. And I think that's just, you know, that's how you build successful leaders and whether they stay with you or not you're giving them a set of skills that'll that'll be valuable to them the rest of their career yeah she's thriving she's uh she she's one of those that lucked out she worked for you for a number of years your chief of staff at one point she's now with ashish parmar at tapestry uh coach brands kate spade and uh just doing phenomenally well so uh she gives gives you a lot of credit for that uh, so thank you annette for uh for doing this uh Got one, one, actually two more questions, Chris, uh, from, from uh, some, some friends here. So let's listen in to uh, mystery question number three. Hi, Chris. I was wondering if you could spend a few minutes to talk about how you manage yourself and manage your teams through um, uh, times of crisis and uh, really high stress situations. I think uh, from my experience, it always seemed like you managed uh, to maintain grace under pressure uh, and manage to help your team stay focused as well. I've always been curious what about your background, your philosophy, your leadership style uh, allowed you to do that? 
Yeah, uh, Leon Chisholm. Leon's a, a really bright technology leader. He's been at a, he was with me at Orbitz and has been a CTO for several organizations. And uh, it was one of those, you know, like really thoughtful leaders who always wanted to get better. And that question is very consistent with with Leon and how he thinks. We went through a lot in the early days of of Orbitz together. And one particular incident, we had a major database outage. Right? And Orbitz was an online business. That's all we had, you know, booking flights, you know, car rentals. And basically our Oracle database crashed. And the interesting thing about that, which is, you know, a, a little side story, but kind of interesting, is it was one of the first implementations of the um, rack clustering technology. Which fundamentally meant that, you know, you had a central nervous system that was a brain that was in charge of kind of a distributed database, simply put. And I remember the CEO asking me, like, hey, what, you know, first couple of weeks, what are your thoughts? And I said, well, you know, we got some leadership development opportunities. We got some talent gaps. But I said, this, this Oracle database technology makes me uncomfortable because not that it wasn't innovative and good, but that it hadn't been time tested, right? Mm-hmm. They, had, they hadn't been through major failures and, you know, bringing the system back. And so anyway, like literally within a week, the, the entire, you know, database goes dark. Which, right? So our, biz, our business is out. And our business was out for, oh, uh, it ended up being, I think, like 27 hours. Right. So think of it. Your website's gone. You know, you got a splash page up saying, you know, we're working on it. You know, check back soon. And no one's booking anything. No one's changing their flights. It was bad. And the CEO, uh, Jeff Katz, airline guy. Um, and, you know, Jeff could be a little volatile at times. The CFO had his moments. And these guys are losing their minds. And, and I'm right. I'm working with my folks to say, all right, let's triage this. What's the root cause? What's going on? Like, what's the restoration plan? And unfortunately, like I said, Oracle hadn't been through this too many times. So they were not as helpful as they would typically be. And we went ahead and got uh, the largest Sunbox we could find, because we were a Sun customer, in Chicago. We got it transported to our data center and we basically brought up, it was a race between rebuilding the, the rack, Oracle Rack database or kind of standard Oracle. And interestingly enough, we got the Rack database back like a couple hours before we got the other database res- restored. But I'm like, no, I'm taking the extra two hours. We're gonna go with something proven that we know how to manage, that Oracle knows how to manage. And yeah, I was there the entire time with the team. Uh, we were up for, I was up for like almost, you know, 40 hours straight. And I was, you know, we're whiteboarding, you know, alternatives. Um, you know, I, I'm at that point in my career, I'm not, a, I'm not on the keyboard. But I am with the team and I am in the room and I'm getting them pizza. I'm you know, there to ask questions, to poke and to prod a bit, but fundamentally just be supportive and to run interference with, you know, some folks in the management team that were, were, you know, not particularly happy, nor should they be, right? Our shareholders and our customers were not being served well during that period of time. But to me, it's taking, right, getting overly uh, anxious and, you know, it's not, that's not good servant leadership, right? Beating yeah. people over the head with a two by four is not particularly constructive, right? Your job is to help them do what they can do. You can't do it. Back to who's who's more important? I wasn't getting on the keyboard. And that was, it, it's interesting, partly because of its timing, right? It was in my first, you know, couple months at Orbitz. And the the strength of the relationships that were developed during that two days was was really really important for my future with that team, mm. and they were a bunch of high flying, super smart 
super smart tech folks. I mean, really, really good. A lot to learn about how to lead and manage technology and, and a technology organization. And we went on that journey together and did a lot of really cool things. And I'm really proud of Leon and his career. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it was definitely a defining moment and a, a good teaching moment for him and, and the rest of the team. He told me the story as well. And he's like, he's like, we all knew that you were getting arrows from the CEO and the CFO and, and, uh, they knew it was not fun for you, but they never felt any of that pressure because they got to focus on the problem. They got to just focus on the work, which was hard, uh, but really meant a lot to them. And you talk a lot about leadership development. I know you're very um, proud of the people that you invested in, mentored, grew. Got the the final question here from someone who's become a CIO who used to work for you and uh, one of your great success stories. So let's listen to his question and He's got another great criticism here that we'll have we'll have some fun with. So so listen in. Chris, you've always done a great job at developing leaders. Uh, you've referred to the process, you know, with me as punching your tickets. Um, throughout your leadership journey, you've developed so many leaders and created this great leadership family tree. My question to you is, how do you identify those future leaders, and then how do you identify the areas that you feel they need to punch their tickets? Well, Ryan Kane, uh, he's currently the CIO at uh, TQL, um, a logistics business, and he was had different roles for me on my team at Kroger. Uh, so, two, I guess, two thoughts. You know, sir, first, first question that Ryan asked was about identifying leaders, and I think it's a, it's a really great question, and I don't have a specific formula for it, but I look for people that. Um, you know, it's in basketball, we, we always would use the analogy of who would get the loose ball, right? If there's a loose ball on the court playing basketball, who would get it? And I look for people who, who want to get it, right? Who raise their hand as tough as the situation might be and go, I want, I want to play, right? I want to, I want to get the loose ball. So that's probably the first thing I look for. I, I look for people who aren't afraid, who clearly are willing to take risks. And in some cultures, right, that's hard because if pe- when I got to Kroger as an example, right, that group, now, by the way, at Orbitz, I had a lot of risk takers. So <laughs> I didn't have to look far to find them. But at Kroger, that wasn't rewarded. And finding those risk takers was took a little bit more energy. But as you look for them, you look for people that, you know, want to take risk want to raise their hand. And I also look for people who have a good, that's the right word, good ability for self-assessment. They know who they are. They know what they're good at. And they know what they're not good at. The hardest people to to develop are the ones who have a, uh, their self-assessment is off multiple degrees. They have no awareness. They have just no no self-awareness. So I look for that. And I look for people then, you know, back to what do you what do you do with a person who's got those base set of skills? In the case of Ryan, be, he's a poster child for this this you know, story. How do I give them experiences? And I mentioned a few of those with Annette Hader on the communications front. With Ryan, it was. You know, he came up through the kind of the DBA ranks and and I I need to get him in development. Right. I need to get him in development for lot, lots of reasons. But one is it's more connected to the business. And I would take Ryan with me on, you know, when I would go out to the field to visit stores. Right. I, and I'm not just Ryan, but I would take my up and coming leaders and I'd take them with me. And I'd go, look, you're coming with me and we're going to King Supers out in Denver. And we did these division visits where we would go talk to the executive teams and all the divisions. And at the time, there were maybe 18. I think now they probably have close to 30. But my first couple of years, I went to see every division every year. And people thought I was crazy. People thought I was nuts. This is a lot of travel. But I did it for three reasons. One, build credibility with the people at the front line running, running our stores. Right, because they made stuff happen every day. Uh, two was to really understand the business, and to 
like understand like what are your issues like what can't you do that you need to do where where can my team help you be successful and the the third thing was to help develop my my leadership team give them the opportunity to to do the same things i was doing but see it through like a different lens and that would have never happened in that that culture um, in the company before I got there. And that was part of the reason that, you know, there weren't a lot of like really strong leaders uh, ready to go when I walked in the door. And you, you have to, you have to grow people and you have to grow them quickly. And yeah, so diversity of experience is important. Getting them trained, you know, media training, communications training. I, they got more of that than they ever probably wanted. And, and we also built, which I was super proud of, and, and I, I, this question makes me reflect on it a bit, but we basically built a leadership development program partnering with the University of Cincinnati and their MBA program. And, their, um, and it was great. And I kind of joked often that it was brainwashing. Um, and, you know, cause I, but I wanted people to have this consistent understanding of leadership and management, and I wanted to have a common vocabulary for how we went to, to market, like how we branded ourselves, and, and how we would talk to the organization and what was a best practice and you know, how do you do it well. And to me, um, you know, board conversations, if I could yank a team member of mine to the board, absolutely. I got, you know, multiple members of my team in front of the board, you know, as quick as I could. But yeah, was it exposure? Nah, less exposure. I mean, yeah, part of it, they wouldn't remember their names probably, but the developmental side of that for them personally was enormous because I wanted to get them comfortable with an exec in the boardroom. And we actually also paired up um, our team members with uh, executives in the business. And it was kind of like the buddy program and and that had somebody and Ryan had somebody, but the goal was to, Right, get them comfortable, you know, talking technology, but to people who are not technologists, right? So that's back to this communications thing. It's getting building a relationship that they can tap into later. And it was one of many things that, you know, helped grow these folks. I remember taking some folks with me to India because we had, you know, some team members in India. I had several people that were not crazy about that trip. I'm like, it is not an optional trip. We're not going to have this conversation. Get your passport. You know we're going. Punching your ticket. Yeah, but you gotta. You have to punch those tickets because when opportunities come up, and you've punched all those tickets. I remember my first CIO role at FedEx. I got getting promoted to CIO of the Express business, and I was thirty-five, I think, at the time. I was pretty young. Mm. And I had grown very fast in my career, but boy, I had punched so many tickets. I had worked in tracking and tracing. I'd worked in logistics. I'd worked in billing. Uh, The only thing I hadn't done was, you know, some of the aviation um, systems. I'd been in the sorting systems. I'd been damn near everywhere. I'd lived internationally. I'd run international technology. And every, I'd say not everyone, but damn near every senior exec in the business knew who I was. And yeah, I worked hard and I, it wasn't always successful, but I was successful more often than not. And my teams, you know, we had, we had, we'd built a good reputation, right? So when the opportunity came up, I remember the question that I got asked in the interview. It's like, well, hey, are you, are you, you know, ready for this job? Will you, are you going to be successful in this role? And I said, well, I'm confident I will learn the role and be successful, but I can't say with 100% confidence because I've never done it. But every other role I've taken on in my career, I've figured out and I've, I've been successful. So I think I'll be okay. But it was a fair question, right? If you ask me that question today, I mean, I've been retired for almost four years, but could I go back and, and run technology for anybody? I'm highly confident I could do it. But I've done it, you know, half a dozen times for a bunch of different companies. And, you know, so, but I think that question, from Ryan and that punching tickets is super important. And sometimes one of my leadership, you know, philosophies about, you know, finding, finding, find a good mentor. They might not find you. 
go go out and seek someone. And frankly, I always had multiple role models for things. This person's a great leader of projects. This person's a great communicator. This per, you know, and, and pick those role models, learn from them, find a good mentor. And, you know, when you find someone who's great at developing people and you get to work with them and, you know, that's a blessing, but that's not always going to be the case. A lot of uh, themes here that I hope people really pay attention to because I think we've gotten pretty lax in a lot of these things. And I'm really worried about the future Ryan's and the future Annette's because they're not getting these opportunities. And, uh, you know, I'm curious, Chris, you know, you've had four years since uh, being in an operational role. Uh, looking back on the career, you know, the, the question around if I knew then what I know now, you know, anything you, you would have done different or led in a different way? It's a really good question. I don't often look back. I'm a glass half full person and, and look forward. I, in reflection, and I mentioned this earlier, uh, to say I was a little impatient at times would be fair. Were my expectations of myself high? Yeah. Were they too high maybe for others at times? Possibly. You know, I think about, you know, organizations that I left and, you know, could I have handled, you know, my FedEx situation differently with, with this, you know, my, my boss, um, I had two bosses, but yeah, Dennis Jones, who you would remember, did I handle that as well as I could handle it? Uh, probably not. Was I impatient? Would I get frustrated? But you know, to me, back to honesty and transparency, like when things aren't right, they're not right. And I remember going to Fred Smith, um, you know, at the time, and I go, Fred, I'm leaving. And because it was a values based issue, right? And I didn't think Dennis was doing the right thing for the shareholders. I mean, it wasn't illegal, it was just an investment. I didn't think it was the right investment. And we had this conversation, and Fred's like, you know, yeah, it's Dennis, but you know. You still have your stripes. He's a military guy. Everything's fine. I'm like, no, Fred, it's not fine. I'm leaving. And he's like, no, you're not. Let's talk about technology. And I was gone two weeks later. And he wrote me a letter a year later that basically said, um, uh, you, you were trying to tell me something that I really didn't hear. And Dennis was gone six months after I was gone. And yeah, you know, it's basically Fred's way of saying, you know, hey, I missed this one. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and he he had a, a couple chances where we were in forums together over the last, you know, decade of my career. And, you know, he was just incredibly generous and uh, very um, appreciative of the things that, you know, we had done together. And, um, but it's like sometimes you, you just got to say, no, I'm not doing this. And, could I, like I said, could I have handled a different way, Dan? Probably. Could I have been more patient? But would it, would things have changed? That's the thing you never know, right? Would Dennis have done it differently? Would he have changed? Maybe he would have still been there, right? Which would have not been good from my perspective. In fact, one of the execs basically said, he's not going anywhere. But if you leave, I predict he's he's not going to make it. Interesting. Yeah. Right. Interesting. We, which to me is a leader. And, and so it's the, the, the reflection often for me was the people side of it and leaving an organization behind and a team of people at FedEx who I had an enormous amount of respect for and, and loved working with. And that was hard. It's always the hardest part when you're, when you, when you go deep with an organization and you build those relationships and, you know, the Innets and the Leons and the Ryans and, and hundreds and thousands of others, that's, that's hard. Like, yeah. You spend more time with them than you do your family. Yeah, it's hard, but it's special. And it's you, these are things you talk about all the time when we're together. And, um, you know, we're kind of we're kind of winding it down, Chris. But, you know, one thing I don't want to get away without uh, asking you a uh, fun fact about Chris that uh, makes you really interesting. You are very passionate about cooking. You mentioned making an apple pie earlier. Um, what's it like when you're in that zone and what's your favorite thing to, to cook? Ooh, well, it, it's I love it because it was a way for me to not think about anything else, right? You have to stay focused. 
And in my career, you know, working crazy hours and, you know, the pressure of the job, two things were good. I always exercised, you know, it's, it's great to have an extra hour to a day for yourself when you retire. So all you out there that are getting close to that or thinking about it, it is awesome to have that time. But cooking was one of those like mini reliefs, mini stress relievers. And you'd go into the zone and, and you wouldn't think about all the other stuff. And to me, that was super valuable. And it's always a family event for us. So it's always around, you know, whether it's the immediate family who's living in the house at the time, or we have four grandkids that live 10 minutes away. So it's, we do like every Sunday or Saturday, we have a family dinner. And so for me, favorite thing to, to make, uh, you name it, I'm on the grill smoking things. I'm in the kitchen baking. I will tell you these days, probably the most satisfaction is figuring out how to make a gluten-free cake that everyone likes because I have two celiacs in the family and, you know, I'm not using gluten is hard in the baking world. And I'd say I'm, I'm far from an expert, but I'm anxious to continue to get better. I love it. I love it. What a, what a great journey. Uh, and just true to your form right there, you know, just continue to get better. Well, Chris, this has been amazing. I've learned uh, a lot. I've known you pretty well, but learned a lot today. I know our audience has, and Really excited. We're going to continue the conversation. We're going to write something up for CIO.com next week. Okay. And uh, I want to dig into more of your leadership development nuggets. In fact, the seminar that you've developed and actually teach every opportunity you get. So we'll unpack that those lessons and the skills, the attitudes, the mindsets that really differentiate top leaders today. So thanks so much, Chris. Great to be with you. You're welcome, Dan. It was, it was a pleasure. You've been listening to Tech Whispers, inside the playbook of the best digital leaders, a Woolet and Associates podcast. Keep connected with us by subscribing to the show in your favorite podcast player. If you like what you've heard, please rate the show as this helps us connect the world's best digital leaders with those who aspire to learn, grow, and thrive in this amazing profession. Thanks for listening. Until next time.